Um, before I get started, I also want to thank the Duke Law Democrats who gave a lot of support to this event, including Ben Stark especially, who spent his morning running around filling in some details that I forgot to do earlier, so thanks, Ben. Larry Korb served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Manpower, Reserve Affairs, Installations, and Logistics from 1981 until 1985. In that position, he administered about 70% of the defense budget, and for his service, he was, re he was awarded the Department, of Defense's, D the Department of Defense's Medal for Distinguished Public Service. Mr. Korb also served for act on active duty for four years as a Naval Flight Officer, and he retired from the Naval Reserve at the rank of Captain. He has published 20 books and more, than tw and more than 100 articles on national security issues and is a leading expert on military manpower and logistics issues. He's currently a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and having worked with him this summer, he's one of the nicest guys that, I've, that I know. So I'm thrilled to introduce Larry. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ian. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. As I was telling uh, Ian, two of my four children are attorneys, so I'm quite familiar with uh, the things that you're, you're go going through now. And I know you've got a lot of things on your mind. So uh, let me spend about 20 minutes kind of explaining to you, I think, uh, uh, what I'd like you to think about in terms of uh, our current national security situation. And I'll take your questions on whatever I say or anything else you might find interesting. Well, you know, it's, exact, it's four years and 10 days since the horrible events of September 11th. And if I had come here four years ago and said four years from this day, we would be in the current situation, I don't think anybody would have believed me. Uh, you know, go back and you look in, in history, four years after the attack on, on Pearl Harbor, we had Hitler was dead, Mussolini was dead, Tojo was in jail. We were occupying Germany and, and Japan. Now, where are we four years after September 11th? Well, your volunteer army is about to self-destruct. And I go around and speak at a lot of college campuses. Everybody wants to know, are we going to have a draft? You know? Well, the fact of the matter is, I don't think so, but the fact is that we sent probably the most qualified army we've had uh, in, our, in our history into Iraq, and it's not going to come out whenever it does in, in very, very, very good, uh, good, good shape. We're broke. Okay? We uh, <clears throat> are, as you see, when trying to, President asking for money for, for Katrina, even members of his own party are, are, are upset about it because simply, you know, we have budget deficits and trade deficits. And of course, one of the interesting things, given what concern about national security, we're borrowing a lot of money, including from a country that the administration had labeled a strategic uh, competitor, uh, uh, China. Uh, terrorist incidents are up. If you look at the State Department figures, of course, they didn't want to put them out, but they went up by about one third in the, in the last year. Al Qaeda, has gotten more recruits and it's sort of metastasized. It's, it's franchised out, as you've seen with the attacks uh, in London and the attacks in, 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 in Madrid. Our standing in the world, in terms of you know, what people around the world think of us, is at an all-time all low. And nuclear proliferation has increased. North Korea you know, has, probably has nuclear weapons. Iran is, is defying the... Uh, uh, interna international community on it. And so the question becomes, well, why are we there? How did we end up in such a situation? Now, that doesn't mean certain things haven't been done. You know, if you take an airplane like I did this morning and do a lot, and particularly you come through, you know, the Washington airports, you see a lot, a lot, you know, it takes you a lot longer to get through. So there, you know, people obviously have done some things. But by and large, how did we get into the situation where things are not where they should be? Well, the first mistake we made was, or have made, is we have not defined the enemy. You know, we talk about a war on terrorism. That would be like in World War II saying we're declaring war on Blitzkrieg or we're declaring war on Kamikaze. That's a tactic. Uh, terrorism, you'll never win. And in fact, if you read the president's speech that he gave the National Cathedral, after uh, September 11th, and he talked about not only getting rid of terrorism, but getting rid of the world of evil. Well, good luck. 
the fact of the matter is that our enemies are a group of radical jihadists. Al-Qaeda, of course, means the place. Uh, but these are people who don't like our policies. It's not that they hate our freedoms. Okay? They don't like our policies. Now, one of the great ironies is the policies they don't like, a lot of us don't like them either. Uh, because what they don't like is our support for regimes in their part of the world that they think do not treat their people well. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, Jordan, those countries, they don't like those policies. Now, we would like a different uh, type of uh, system there than they would. They want to kind of go backwards in terms of uh, the caliphate, you know, back from uh, the uh, sixth or seventh century. But on the other hand, it's great irony. We both agree that those regimes are not good for the, uh, for the people, and that's what, they, uh, that's what they don't like. And until we understand that, it becomes difficult for us uh, to, uh, to deal with them. Second problem we have is we have the wrong strategy. We have the wrong enemy, and we got the wrong strategy. Now, if you have time, I really encourage you to go on the White House website and read Bush's national security strategy, which came out in 2002. <clears throat> so just about, it came out right about this time uh, in 2002. And basically lays out his strategy for dealing with what he calls the war against uh, terrorism. Now, since you're all lawyers, just as an aside, I think what I'd love somebody to do is get a class action suit because the law says you're supposed to put out a strategy every year. Well, they've only had one in five years, so if anybody would like to take the case, I don't know where we would go or who we would sue, but the fact of the matter is they've only put out one, and I happen to think it's the wrong one. Now, the strategy basically has three elements. Now, I will say this. It's clearly written compared to a lot of government documents, some of which I had a hand in uh, writing. This is clearly written, and it's to the point. As the president said that you know, he wants the boys in Lubbock to understand uh, that. When I mention that around the world, I have to define Lubbock, but I'm sure you all know what, uh, what, that, means, uh, what, that, what that means here. OK, <clears throat> the strategy has three elements. And the first element is a new doctrine in international law or international politics of preventive war. Now, if you, think, if you can remember only one thing from what we talk about today, there's a big difference between preemption and preventive war. Now, what preemption says is if I have actionable intelligence that somebody is about to inflict harm on me, I do not have to wait till they do it. In other words, you might call it anticipatory self-defense, but any doctrine of international law, I don't have to wait. That's not preemption. Now, in the last campaign, we got confused about it because Kerry one time mentioned, you know, well, I'd like to see a global test. And of course, the Republicans beat the heck out of them to say, ah, oh, you're going to outsource our security and you're going to let all these countries who don't wish us well have a veto. and Never do that. I think what he was talking about, or should have been, was preventive war. Now, what preventive war says that I have the right, the duty, the president, given what happened on September 11, to wage war against countries that have the capability to hurt me. Not that are about to, not an imminent threat, but have the capability to inflict harm on me. And I will decide. The United States will be judge and jury. And of course, that's the reason we went to war in Iraq. Iraq was not an imminent danger. But given what happened on September 11, the president felt that things had changed. Now, if you want to wage preventive war, you should have a global test, or you should get the sanction of the international community in one way or another. And we did it in Persian Gulf War I, as well as Afghanistan. And if you look at how those wars were waged, uh, and you look at the support we got for them, even if you don't like preventive war, or I mean do like preventive war, don't think it's illegal, the fact of the matter is, from a practical point of view, it's much better when you do it. The first Persian Gulf War, we had over 200,000 troops from other nations. And you know how much it cost us taxpayers? Zero. In fact, we made a profit on the war because we collected based upon a three-month war 
uh, other countries had agreed to pay 80 percent of the of the incremental cost and it only lasted it lasted you know mercifully less than that period of time and we never did give the money back uh, <clears throat> and of course if you look at Afghanistan we went into Afghanistan now we have NATO in there helping us NATO invoked article Article 5, the UN approved it. Then we had the bond meeting after that in which people, you know, put up money for Iraqi, Iraqi reconstruction. And, e and again, if you take a look at the long-term impact, if preventive war becomes a new doctrine in international politics, meaning you can decide yourself, what's to prevent India from saying, look at Pakistan, you know? Musharraf is, you know, given some of his statements he just made about women, he's a little bit off of his rocker here. He doesn't have, you know, the support that he needs. And they got weapons of mass destruction. He's supporting terrorists in, uh, <clears throat> in Kashmir, so we're going to go in after him. What's to prevent that? Okay. And we can't say, well, wait, you've got to go to the UN, you've got to do something. Well, we, we put a new doctrine by going uh, into Iraq. Second component of this is democracy, uh, <clears throat> pushing democracy by force of arms if necessary. In other words, the idea that all the world should live as we do, the American form of democracy, and we're going to make that happen. As I told somebody, you know, and the administration will say, you know, well, wow, this is Woodrow Wilson. I said, no, this is Woodrow Wilson on steroids, okay, is what we're talking about. When Wilson wanted to make the world safe for democracy. You want to make it democratic. And of course, you see, that's what we're, we're trying to do uh, uh, in, in, in Iraq. And even if you could do it by force of arms, the fact of the matter is that around the world, and I think this is one of the reasons why our standing is not the way that it, uh, that it, that it should be, is you get accused of hypocrisy. Because if you say, oh, we're only going to deal with democratic regimes, it's, well, what about Uzbekistan? Well, we need the bases there. You know, what about Pakistan? Well, we need overflight rights, and we need their cooperation to, you know, to get, uh, uh, to get, get, get al-Qaeda. Al We've always dealt with non-democratic regimes, and we always will. I mean, we allied ourselves with Stalin in World War II, okay? A 20 million, 30 million people that he killed. When I was in government, I got sent over to China to help China modernize their logistic system. If we ever had a, a military conflict, I can tell you one of the reasons they'll do well is we, I, I was told by the White House, take the best logisticians that you have, take them over there. Why? Because we wanted them to counterbalance the Soviet Union back in the, uh, <clears throat> back in the 19, 1980s. And then the final component is military dominance. And this goes to the idea of American exceptionalism. We would only use our power uh, for the good of the world. And the president talks about, you know, these values are not God's gift to, uh, <clears throat> to, you, to the American people. They're God's gift to humanity. Recently, I was up in uh, Canada, and one of my Canadian counterparts said, you know, when did God start speaking to American presidents? I mean, when exactly did that happen? But this idea that somehow we have this power and use it. And, and the problem with military dominance, and it gets to my ne ne next point, uh, is that uh, you begin to neglect other points in other parts of uh, your arsenal that you have to combat your enemies. Too much military, not enough uh, spending on, for example, public diplomacy, or, uh, or, or for, foreign aid. All right, and that gets to the second thing we'll talk about. You've got the wrong priorities. If you look in providing for national security, you have three components. Offense, which is primarily the Department of Defense. Defense, which is a homeland security. And then you have prevention, which is primarily uh, things like foreign aid and <clears throat> um, <coughs> uh, pu public, public diplomacy. Well, take a look, OK? Give you an example. We spend more on one program in the Department of Defense, which may or may not work, national missile defense, close to about $10 billion a year, than the entire Coast Guard. Now, if somebody is about to do us harm and wants to uh, hit us with a nuclear weapon, if they fire it toward us against this national missile defense, first of all, it's going to have a return address. So we would know where it comes from and we could take action wouldn't they might be much more likely to bring it in in a container and smuggle it into the United States? Well, we're only expecting 6% of the containers. 
Our Coast Guard, I did a calculation, there are 39 navies in the world. Our Coast Guard, uh, I count them as a navy. They're the second oldest. And they don't get much money because they get buried in the Department of Homeland Security. I won't even talk about you know, how much money FEMA was getting in the Department of, uh, of, of, Homeland, of Homeland Security. So we, so much on offense, the defense budget, and I'm not counting the war in Iraq or Afghanistan, that's paid for separately. The baseline defense budget between 2001, 2005 goes up 40% in real terms. That's after, uh, after, <clears throat> after inflation. Um, you uh, take a look. Uh, last year, the Pentagon was told, well, you have to cut your baseline budget back because we got this deficit and the president's trying to, you know, reduce, uh, reduce the fed federal deficit. You know the first thing they offered up? Nuclear, th uh, co nuclear threat cooperation money, sometimes known as Nun Luger. What's that? That's you buy up the fissile materials in the Soviet Union. Any of us here could make a nuclear bomb. Well, you could. I don't think I could. But go on the net, figure out how to do it. You've got to get the material. That's the hard part. If you take a look at the four years before September 11th and the four years of, since September 11th, when did we spend more money on the Nun Luger or the nuclear threat cooperation? The four years before. You say, wait a second. After September 11th, this is the real, and this both Kerry and Bush agreed in, in the campaign, is the existential danger is a nuclear weapon falling into the hands of a terrorist group with global, global reach. But yet, the Pentagon wanted to even cut it back more. Uh, so if you take a look, I'd say, you know, we have the, the wrong, pri wrong priorities. And then finally, we've got the wrong people. If you take a look at the people that you have in charge of doing the things that need to be done, Basically, the people that the president has put in have not measured up to the task. You know, when World War II came and Franklin Roosevelt, he brought in Republic, get the best people. You know, far as get people from Wall Street, no matter what. The country's at war. We're not going to do business as usual. Uh, what Lyndon Johnson had a term good he called jobs for slobs, where, you know, people you got to pay off in the work in the campaign. Okay, uh, we got to have a crisis. Now, look, look, take a look at you know, Mr. Brown in FEMA. Yes, it's been a political dumping ground. And <clears throat> I worked when I was in government. We had this real clown in there who was terrible. I, I, I've seen it before. OK, even if you did it before, after September 11th, you can't, OK? Because this is the agency in charge of coordinating our response to not just man-made, I mean, not natural disasters, but it could be a man-made disaster. So why are you putting somebody in there who was the roommate of your former chief of staff, okay? And again, if you look throughout the government, um, when I went, I was sent to Iraq in, in November 2003, Rumsfeld rounded up, I guess, a lot of us old guys who had worked in the Pentagon there to go give an, give an assessment. And I get over and I knew Ambassador Bremer, Jerry Bremer, and he's up there. You know where Bremer was ambassador to? Anybody know? An Arab country? The Netherlands. Okay, why we said well because he was acceptable to the neocons, or he was one of the State Department guys that was considered hardline enough. The Ayatollah wouldn't even talk to him. Okay, now, Jerry's a nice guy, very competent. Okay, but he's not the person that you would want to send there. George Tenet, the head of the CIA, he was a congressional staffer who sort of got there by accident. Okay. We're at war now, George, go back and do something else. Now you, you, and then you compound it, you reward these people. They give them the Medal of Freedom after they, after they uh, mess up. Condi Rice, was, she'd probably be a better Secretary of State, but she was a terrible national security advisor. Who was coordinating the Pentagon and, and the State Department and everything for the post-combat phase? Who was saying to the President when you know, Tennant said it was a slam dunk that the weapons of mass destruction, okay, well, what's your evidence? Okay, well, you know, where is it? Mr. President, let me tell you something. You asked the right question, which if we can believe Bob Woodward, he did. So, well, you know, that reason you give me there, George, I don't know if that would, you know, go, go, go over. Okay. Paul Wolfowitz, now the head of the World Bank. Okay. He was the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Well, the job of Deputy Secretary of Defense is to run the Pentagon, the world's largest organization. It's a job that's been held by, among other people, David Packard. Okay. Uh, it's been held by <clears throat> Don Atwood, who was head of General Motors. Okay, this is a job. 
Wolfowitz didn't run the place. Okay? He was off making policy. Right? And he was off telling General Shinseki, the Army Chief of Staff, how many troops you would need after Saddam fell. Shinseki said several hundred thousand. Wolfowitz says he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, I'll tell you something, nobody was running the Pentagon because somebody should have said, okay, we're going to war. What happens when Saddam falls? Who's in charge? Okay. What do we do? Those are the questions that a good manager, uh, good, good manager would ask. Don Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, great peacetime. Pentagon needed to be shaken up. People needed to begin thinking differently. But terrible wartime secretary because he's trying to do the military's job. You know who was a terrific wartime Secretary of Defense? Dick Cheney back in the first Persian Gulf. You saw Colin Powell giving the briefings, okay? He stood in the background, okay? Like, hey, I don't know anything about this. He's, he's running the war, okay? Then you see Rumsfeld up there, you know? He's, he's like, okay, so you have the, so you compound it, you got the wrong enemy, the wrong strategy, and the, and, and the, wrong, uh, and the wrong, wrong people. Now, let me end, and I'll take your questions on a couple of optimistic notes. Uh, <clears throat> I think basically the strategy, given what's happened in Iraq, they won't admit it, but by and large, they have recognized, look, we'll be, we need stability there. We're not going to make a democracy. We just don't have the wherewithal to, to do that. Uh, <clears throat> and nor do we have the wherewithal, if you go back and you this preventive war, and you read the president talking about the axis of evil. You know, there's a lot of people around them. You know, if you read Richard Pearl and David Fromm's book, you know, okay, today Iraq, tomorrow Iran, North Korea, Syria, but we're going to wipe them all out. You know, we're going to go from, you know, one to the, uh, you know, one to the other. Well, we recognize we can't do that, which I think is why we've, you know, got in with the, the Europeans. We got involved in the negotiations with Iran and uh, even with North Korea, why we're accepting or a deal that may or may not be a deal, but the fact of the matter is we know that we, you know, we can't, uh, we can't uh, do that. And if you look at the President's speech at the United Nations last week, it was a rather humble speech in talking about working with other nations and putting more money into things like, uh, uh, like uh, far, far, foreign aid. So I do think that the, those heady days are over, and the question becomes now, will we be able uh, to uh, deal with the <clears throat> situation uh, in Iraq. Now, let me conclude on one note here and uh, got to put a plug for my uh, own thing that I did. I, I got so fed up, you know, when I said the administration just needs to put out a new national security strategy. So I said to the people working with me, well, we'll do, let's, why don't we do one? So we did. We put out our own national security strategy, and the administration won't, and this follows on a study I did when I was at the Council on Foreign Relations of various alternatives to the Bush strategy, and we called it integrated power. And basically, if you want that, we don't sell our books. You can get them for free. Just go on our website and download it. And uh, in fact, I gave a speech for the government. They called me up. They said, I want 300 copies of the book. So I said, well, download them. He said, well, that's too much trouble. And so I said, well, how come I got to get 300 copies? And so anyway, uh, she said, well, we'll buy them from you. I said, how much should we charge? I asked people. We've never charged anything for a book. So I made up a number. I said, $10 each. And so she said, well, can you give us the government rate? I said, OK, nine. I said, all right, fine. So then they sent the check in. And all the way, I said, what do we do with it? I, I don't know. Here it is. You take it, you know. And, and, and deal. But you can download it and read it. And basically what we're trying to say is, look, you need hard power, military and economic power, but you also need soft power rely on <clears throat> diplomacy, rely on uh, foreign aid. And your enemies really are threefold. You've got these radical jihadists who don't like our policies. You've got extremist regimes that you need to deal with, and not just with hard power. And, you need, and the third is weak and failing states. And if you look at the president's speech last week in the United Nations, I he recognized that, that these weak and failing states can become havens for terrorists. So even if you won't want to help them because it's the right thing to do in terms of you know, who we are and what we, and what we stand for, the fact of the matter is that it is, uh, it is a national security issue. All right, let me stop there and uh, take whatever questions or comments you might have. Yes, sir. Uh, I noticed early in the speech, uh, talk, you said you know you have on a plane, and you know we have this new airport security measures and everything like that. Do you actually view those as being effective, or just a lot of shows? It sort of seems that 
you know, there's a lot of some holes inside airport security. That's one of the fundamental problems. You know, they're they're making us, you know, toss away our little nail clippers and things like that, and they're kind of missing guns on occasion and grenades. So it really seems that you know they're we're being shown we're doing something, we're doing something. Please vote for us. But you know whether or not it's actually working or or effective is, seems to be very questionable. Well, I think you have a good point. Certainly, it's better than it was before September 11th. Okay. The real question is: Is it as good as it should be, given all of the money that we've put into it and and, and uh, you know how it's been done? And probably not. But the other thing you have to ask yourself is: Are you putting so much into airline that you're ignoring trans you know transportation, uh, you know ground transportation? You know railroads and things, things like that, and I think that's the you know the the, the real the, the real issue that you have you have to confront. Look, you can't buy perfect security, so you devise a system. Now it's amazing, you know, for years the Europeans were way ahead of us in checking in. They seem to find. I mean, you know, I almost missed the flight. I had to go to Copenhagen last week. I almost missed the plane out of Dulles. It took me an hour and a half after I had my ticket to get through security. Uh, coming in Copenhagen, it took me like eight minutes to get through. Okay. So, you know, and these people have been dealing, you know, with it uh, much longer than, uh, than, than we have. So if anything, I, I don't know, you know, and I, I, you know the TSA and, 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 and how they do things, I just happen to think they could, you know, they could, uh, you know, do it a little bit, uh, little bit uh, uh, better. Uh, but I do, I am more concerned about things like, you know, how much do we put guarding nuclear power plants, chemical plants, those are the things. I mean, I think if you really wanted to have a devastating attack on the United States, those would be much more likely targets than plane. And these, you know, these, uh, the, you know, ra radical jihadists or whatever you want to call them, they're smart. You know, they look around and say, okay, they're pretty good at airports, let's go someplace else. As we've seen in Iraq, they're very, you know, they've adapted their, uh, their, their strategy very well. Yes? Um. I'll just ask one question. Do you think we can stop Iran from becoming nuclear? And especially with the new hardliner president who well, is so adamant about it. Here's the issue. First of all, if, let's say, worst case, Iran becomes a nuclear power, what do they do with the weapon? And you basically say to Iran, look, if you want to be a nuclear power, you're not going to get into the WTO. Uh, there's a choice you're going to have to make. And it's not going to make you safer, all right? Uh, now, it, the diplomacy has to be done very, very carefully. But you know, one of the things that I, I, it amazes me, you know, it just shouldn't amaze me, but does concern me. You see all these studies all the time. American kids score lower than country X or Y on math and in reading and all that. And it may, I've never worried about that because uh, you young people are pretty good because you go out and start all these businesses and make a lot of money, and you know. So I don't worry about whether you got your math. But the thing that under, is, people don't understand history. I mean, when you're dealing with the Iranians, you need to remember. And their, you know, new president pointed it out last week. We overthrew the only democracy they ever had and brought the Shah in. And so when they're dealing with us, you can't just walk in and say, "Well, we're the good guys. You know, you shouldn't have nuclear weapons." The other thing, and I didn't get into it, if you take a look at our approach to proliferation, nuclear weapons, our message to the world is basically don't do as we do, do as we say. We're trying to build new nuclear weapons. Well, the non-proliferation treaty says you should be getting rid of them. You know, uh, Al, Al Baraday, I think, said it well. He said, we're like, you know, somebody smoking a cigarette telling other people to stop smoking. I mean, is what. So I think you have to do that. Now, I think we better now working with the Europeans because we have sanctions against Iran, but one country's sanctions aren't going to work. So if the Europeans join with us, uh, you know, in the sanctions, even if you don't get to the Security, to the security Council, um, I think that, you know, that's a, they're going to have to make the decision, and that's what you, you, you say to them. But I don't, I don't know if um, economic sanctions will be enough Iran for so long. Well, let me put it this way. Let's say, worst case, they get them. Then what? What are they going to do with them? Okay? I mean, we have 6,000 nuclear weapons, all right? Nobody, you, you see what I mean? And so, yes, they can get them, and, and then what? All right? Uh, South Africa had them at one time. Argentina was talking about getting them. And the people said, well, okay, now what do we do? Spend a lot of money. 
and here are the costs, and just make it clear. You know, it's interesting. We, we had the thing with Gaddafi, who gave up his attempt to get him, and people say, well, it was the war in Iraq, or this. You know what happened? His son went to the London School of Economics. And he came back and basically said, hey, Dad, uh, there'll be nothing left for me because the sanctions are working, okay? It's hurting us, and so we're going to have to make a choice, okay? And, I mean, that's, I think, what you, ha you, have, to, you have to do when you have to, uh, you know, work with, uh, you know, with the rest of the world. I don't know why we don't talk to them yeah. because, again, given our history with them, I think that's important, see? You may not, well, we have no intention of attacking Iran. Wait a second. The president put it in his axis of evil speech, okay? And in the same way with North Korea. I mean, you know, for when North Korea, in the fall of 2002, North Korea was a much bigger security challenge than Iraq was. Where we basically said, we're not, go away now. We're going to do Iraq first, and we'll get back to this later. So you waited a couple of years, and in fact, they got more, you know, they got more weapons. Now, I got to say this, Christopher Hill does a terrific job this negotiator, much better than Jim Kelly, the guy we had there before, because Kelly couldn't do anything. He was under such tight restrictions, you see, but at least, you know, they're letting him do things. And I thought his statement was wonderful. Oh, well, yes, the North Koreans said this, but, you know, the other countries disagree. Whereas Bush used to say all these horrible things about Kim Jong-il, and he's a horrible person. But it's hard to negotiate with someone, you see, when you use those, use those terms. Yes, ma'am. You've articulated a number of criticisms about how the current administration has handled the challenges presented by September 11th. Why do you think those problems arose? I mean, is it institutional um, inflexibility or, or, or you know, whatever the possibility might be? And are you, I mean, in light of the fact that some of, that there are some changes in the rhetoric being used, and I think probably some changes with Connie Rice as Secretary of State and other um, personnel moves, are you optimistic that there is um, learning taking place in the administration? No. Well, <clears throat> I think if you take a look at the people that Condi Rice has put in, I think she has learned. And, and I've known her for a long time. Now, whether she believed all this so-called neocon stuff, I don't know. I think her problem is she tried to please the president rather than telling him what he needed to needed to hear when she was a national security, security advisor. But, you know, she wouldn't take Bolton as the deputy who, you know, he wanted the job. Now, as Brzezinski said, well, I guess he can do less harm at the UN, you know, if we got to put him someplace. It's a whole other, whole other issue. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, she's put in Bob Zellick and Nick Burns. So she's got a pretty good team. She, what I call the more, the grown-ups, if you will, <clears throat> uh, in, in foreign policy. Now, what happened with the Bush administration basically was that you had a president uninformed in foreign policy. You know, he wasn't a, he's a governor. Clinton was a governor. And you had a group of people who had held this view of American exceptionalism, uh, of American power, of American dominance, uh, and basically the, the idea that, uh, you know, through our force we could basically enforce an example, we could basically change the world. Now, I worked with a lot of these people when I was in government. And Basically, what happened is Reagan stopped paying attention to them after the shootdown of the Korean airliner. Because what happened, if you read about that, when the Korean airliner was shot down, the civilian airliner, by the Soviet Union, all of the we hardliners then said, see, we told you those Soviets are terrible. You know, you can't negotiate with them. You can't do anything. You know, we got to go after them. And Reagan found out that Air Force intelligence basically said, well, it's hard to say this they deliberately set out. But first thing, you know, the Air Force would know. You're flying at night. You look up. You're moving thousands of miles with the crest. You know, what is this plane up there? And we had a spy plane in the area, okay, which was somewhat similar, all right? And so he stopped paying attention to these people and, 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 and changed his view and ended up negotiating with Gorbachev and everything like that. So what happened was after September 11th, <clears throat> then they were able to convince Bush that, you know, this would be the challenge, you know, his, uh, you know, of his administration and, you know, all things came together, kind of his gut feelings and their intellectual uh, appreciation. You know, people, a lot of people under, underestimate Dick Cheney's influence. Dick Cheney, very, very influential. And a lot of people think because he speaks softly and all that, he's moderate. 
when I was in government, this guy was trying, he was in Congress. We were trying to convince Reagan to put sanctions on South Africa, and he was fighting us tooth and nail. Okay, every, now I was, well, not in my area, but every gun control law people, you know, he was against. So people forget how hardline. And back in 1991, he tried, he developed a document in the Pentagon, which was basically, you know, let's run the world. He and Wolfowitz wrote it. Now it was leaked to the New York Times and Brent Scowcroft, then the National Security Advisor, you know, kind of, kind of backed off. So I think all of those things came together and they got carried away. And, and in, in, in a way, the, 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 way <clears throat> the war in Afghanistan, at least on the surface, appeared to go so quick. They said, hey, we're not like the British. We're not going to get bogged down, you know, like the British did and, and the Soviets did in Afghanistan. Look how we whipped right through the, through the place and thought they, they thought we'd be greeted as liberators uh, <clears throat> in Iraq. They really did because they believed Chalabi. Now, Chalabi's an interesting fellow. He's got his own agenda, and you know, he's been able to get his things done. But um, as I told people, and anybody here from New York? Nobody from? All right, well, you would get this. Chalabi had not been in Baghdad since the Dodgers were in Brooklyn, and yet they paid attention to him. And, you know, the, and, and yeah, they thought we'd be out of there. 30, we'd be down to 30,000 troops by the end of 2003. Yes? Yes, you had your hand up yeah, before. Okay, and then we'll go back to it. I was, I was curious. Um, you spoke about uh, us overthrowing the democratically elected government in Iran. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what sort of lessons you think we've learned from that. And I, I guess I'm, in particular, I'm concerned about the sort of noises we've been making about Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and what you think the likelihood is that well, the, the intelligence analysts use the term blowback, okay? When we did it, you know, the interesting thing about what happened was the British wanted to get rid of the government because they wanted the oil, you know, and, and, and basically they tried to get Truman to do it, and Truman didn't buy it. But then when Eisenhower came in and Dulles was much more hardline against the Soviets, they more or less led them to believe that he was going to make an you know, alliance with the, you know, with the Soviets. And, and so that's why, you know, that's why we did it. But I think what you need to understand is this thing we call blowback. Because if you do it, it's going to have long-term ramifications. Now, when you look at it, that doesn't mean you don't do it, because there's no perfect options. If any of you get into government, this is what you're going to realize. Okay? You very rarely ever have something where it's so clear-cut. Well, i got to do this. I don't do it. There are a few things. But by and large, particularly when I get to the president, it's not, you know, there are no, no, easy, uh, no easy, easy options. So, Yes, you need, but then you need to understand it. Okay, having done that, it is not surprising, you see, when they react toward us. Plus, who did we help in the war between Iraq and Iran? Iraq, okay? Now, doesn't mean, but you need to be sensitive to that and you say, okay, now this is why they're saying this. Okay, so maybe we need to then go a little bit uh, you know, farther here to convince them that we really don't want to overthrow them. But if you look at that and you read Bush's statements, what would you think? You know, and I think that's what you have to, you know, have to keep, keep in mind when you, 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 you deal, with these, uh, deal with these things. I mean, you know, when you, with uh, uh, China, I remember when I went to China, you get all, what should you say, what should you say? Well, Taiwan, you know, we may say, wow, you have no right to overthrow Taiwan. To them, Taiwan is part of China. It's sort of like if we said, well, you guys in New York or the United States, you can't go to Long Island anymore. That's claimed by Canada, you know. And, and, I mean, so symbolic, and you need to understand that, uh, you know, because there's a last vestige of, you know, Chinese territory being controlled by, uh, uh, by, by you know, uh, by, by outsiders. And so you, when you approach that, you need to deal with it. In fact, the funny part, I said, well, what should I say? They said, just think, tell them that, you know, we don't think it'll be settled for 50 years. So I said that to the Chinese, oh, that's fine. That's soon enough for us. In other words, they're very, very patient about the whole thing. Because if you're going to have it, it's going to become part of China. Okay. Okay, question in the back. Uh, get there, and then we'll go over here. What if we just had replaced the people? Was, is that 
the idea doomed from the very beginning, or if we had had better negotiators to bring along France and some of the others, and if we had listened to Shinseki and put more troops on the ground and those types of things, could we have succeeded, or was this doomed from the start? Well, it's a terrific question. Um, if you had a Secretary of Defense who was, you know, paid more attention to the military, he would have been supported by Colin Powell. So, you know, what happened to this administration, Powell came in and he was, I would say, represents the traditional Republican Party. I mean, I worked with Colin for three years. And the last time I saw him, he said, are you still a Republican, you know, working at, you know, the Center for America? I said, yeah. I said, I'm a Rockefeller Republican. He said, oh, you can't even say that anymore, you know what I mean, or Eisenhower, you know, Republican. And, and basically, he tried to tell him in the beginning, let's negotiate with North Korea. Let's pick up where Clinton left off in the Middle East, okay? Uh, no, no, so they, you know, they basically, they, they, they isolated him. If you had a different Secretary of Defense who said, well, you know, Powell's got a good idea there, you see, or, um, I mean, it, it could have been different. Or if you had a national security advisor like a Kissinger or Brzezinski or a Brent Scowcroft, okay, who could walk in and tell you something. Now, I, you know, if you've been reading about the events of, you know, Katrina, um, and, the, you know, people said Bush doesn't like people to disagree with him. And he doesn't like people to tell him the truth. Well, let me tell you something, and you'll see this no matter what you do, whether you go into corporate law, you go into government, you're in business, it is so difficult to tell your bosses they're wrong. I've seen people, you know, both from the president and secretary, defense, we're going to go in and tell them, you know, and then you get in and they say, Yes, sir. No, sir. You know, you, you don't, don't tell him. It, 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 it. So if you have a president that makes that worse or a top thing, it, it, it gets out of it. And the other thing that scares me about Bush, he says, well, I don't read the papers. Let me tell you something. If we didn't read the papers, we'd still be in Vietnam. Okay? I mean, it was the reporters that were telling us what's going on. One of the problems you have in Iraq is the reporters can't get out and tell you, because they're all in the green zone. They, and, and they really, you know, that's why Shadid's book, if you got a chance, this guy who, from the Washington Post who is uh, an American of, uh, of Arab extraction who was over there living among the people, you know, and, and he tells you things like, for example, you know, this one family where somebody collaborated with, you know, with the United States, they made the father kill his son. Not because they were supporters of bin Laden, but you see what I mean? And, and you need to, to, to you know, to un un understand, uh, understand it. So when you're not reading the papers, you're not getting the information, he probably thinks things are going well. Or they, you know, the interesting thing is they blame it on the media. It's the liberal media, okay, that's doing this, so we shouldn't pay attention to it, see? And that's, that, I think, is part of the problem. This president needs a Brent Scowcroft. He needs a Jim Baker. Let me tell you something. Scowcroft and Baker would walk in and tell the president, you know, you're wrong, Mr. President. Uh, when I, again, my own experience, Mike Deaver, when he was in government, he was kind of a, not as vicious as Karl Rove, but he was the, the image maker for, for Reagan. Okay. When the Israelis had told us they were going to go into Lebanon and clean out the border areas, and the next thing you know, they were on their way to Beirut, Deaver walked in and said, I quit. And Reagan said, why are you quitting? He said, because, you know, they you know, they're doing what they told us, they wouldn't, and this is going to create chaos in the Middle East, and you can do something about it. Reagan said, why? He said, pick up the phone and call Begin, which he did. You see what I mean? You need someone like that to be, you know, be able to, to, to tell you things. So it's not just the, the people, but this president needed, you know, needed uh, people like that more than, than others, given his decision-making style and, and, you know, what he, what he brought to, to the office. Now, I, I knew his father. I worked with his father. I don't know him well. But the interesting thing is the father was very good in foreign policy, terrific in, in terms of his approach to the world. He was the worst politician I ever met, terrible politician. The current president is a terrific politician, but in terms of governing, you know, he doesn't have anywhere near his father's, uh, his father's skills. Yeah? Is that um, the hostility towards American policy stems from its uh, traditional view on the um, Israeli-Arab conflict. But, well, what is your take on this matter? And do you think that under the current circumstances, the American policy should change? Well, I think the problem with our Middle East policy is we ignored it for too long. Okay, I mean, 
The United States is the only country that has the, you know, the credibility and the power to, to deal with this, uh, this situation. And basically, again, Clinton wanted to, I mean, Colin Powell wanted to pick up where Clinton had left off, okay? And they said no. So we just stepped back, and basically the situation got worse. Now, you do have the perception in the Arab world that we're too pro-Israel. Now, it doesn't, I don't think we are, but the fact of the matter is you got that perception, you got to deal with it, okay? And so those are things that, you know, I think you have to pay attention to. And the president's father, Bush 41 in 1991, I remember he came out himself in a press conference. He said, look, we have an agreement with the Israelis that they're not supposed to build the settlements, okay? But they continue to build them, so until they do that, no more loan guarantees. You know, that's the type of, you know, statement that now, I understand, you know, it, it, it's not terribly popular, and, you know, and I know it's because when I worked for my boss was Weinberger, and his, uh, I, so I get this correct, uh, his dad was Jewish, but his mother wasn't. And when I would go around the country and speak, they'd all say that he wasn't pro-Israel enough, okay? You see what I mean? And so it's different. I mean, I, I understand. But the fact of the matter is the United States needs to get involved. And Scowcroft, in the summer of 2002, when he couldn't get the people in government to pay attention to him, he wrote this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal and basically said, you think Iraq is a big problem in the Middle East. Most people there think it's between Israel and Palestine. And until you get that control, your, your, you know, your impression in that part, of, your, your standing in that part of the world is not going to be what it is, because that's the main issue to all of the, the countries in, 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 that, in that part of the world. And you know, I notice you know, Condi Rice has been saying you know, some things, be critical of the Sharon government. See, one of the problems that you have and you get into this issue is you can be against the policy, say, of Sharon and Netanyahu, that doesn't mean you're anti-Israel or anti-Semitic. But, you know, people many times conflate, conflate those, uh, you know, com conflate those things. In fact, there's more opposition to the Sharon government in Israel than in, you know, in, in many parts of the United States government. Other questions or comments? Yeah. What do you think explained Syria's withdrawal from Lebanon? Syria's withdrawal from Lebanon? A uh, couple of things. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> when I, they underestimated the reaction to, you know, the, the, the killing of Hareri, I, I, I don't think they realized it. The other thing was that this was occasion where we and France basically had passed a UN resolution saying that they had to withdraw. So the people rose up. You had the UN resolution, and Syria would be faced. Okay, this goes back to the question you raised. If they didn't do something, you know, the international community was going to come down hard on them. And if the whole international community, you're going to be hurting economically. And if you're hurting economically, it's hard to stay in power. I mean, they've not only withdrawn, but they've allowed the UN people in there investigating this, this thing because they recognize that they, they, you know, they overstepped their, you know, overstepped their boundaries. And I think they basically made a calculated decision. Look. The basic principle of international relations, nations don't have permanent friends or enemies, they have permanent interests. And never forget that, both if you're studying it or you're involved in it. And they basically looked and said the downside was, was too great because in order, with the uprising, they would have had to use some violent methods. And that would have ruined their, you know, made it easier for the rest of the world to come down. Uh, you know, come down, you know, come down on, come down on them. So I think it was a combination of all of those things. Plus, you know, the, the ruler of Syria does, you know, is not nearly, talk about the wrong people, you know, uh, not nearly the as cunning, clever, masterful as his dad was. I mean, he, I, you know, a lot of on the job training and, 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 and I, I just don't, I think he, let events get away, you know, get, get away from them there. And now he's just trying to, you know, do the best, uh, best that, he, that, he, that he can. Other questions or comments? And, yeah. Um, the response, the open response to uh, Hurricane Katrina received a lot of international press mm -hmm. and basically a lot of, them, well, basically negative. And mm -hmm. do you think, uh, how do you think that affects the, the ability of the U.S. to influence or protect power abroad? Oh, I think it has a terrific impact because, you know, 
part of our problem, this administration I think is worse than others, but all of us have had this go around preaching to the rest of the world, say, or also serving as a model to the rest of the world. And then people are going to look and say, you know, don't be telling us what to do. Look, look, look at the way you guys, you know, uh, do things. Plus, it has exposed things that people who study it knew about, but Nobody, it, it had, we sort of, you know, had lost consciousness about it. The problem of race in this country, the problem of poverty, uninsured, all of those things which people hadn't been paying attention to, all of a sudden they realized that, oh my goodness, you see? And so I, oh, I think it, 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 it hurts. And the other thing is, in the international system, <clears throat> You can't, your influence is related not just to the power you have, but the perception of the power. And people say, God, they couldn't handle a hurricane. You know, look at that doing too well in Iraq. Why should we be worried about them, you see? You know, I mean, and, and that, that hurts your, you know, that hurts your, hurts, your, hurts, your rep, hurts your reputation. And so, I mean, all of those things, yes, I think. And, you know, I've made a couple of trips abroad since then, and I, I got to tell you, I, I'm a, it really bothers me as an American. It really bothers me. First of all, <clears throat> uh, you know, in the beginning, well, they're blaming the governor, they're blaming the mayor, you know, and all of this kind of stuff, and, and, and nobody's worried about the, uh, <clears throat> about the people, the president being on vacation. You know, I don't know. I've never taken five weeks vacation in my life. And I'm not the president, okay? I mean, I've held some administrative jobs. When I was in the Pentagon, I ever took five weeks off. Okay, took off the summer of 2001. I'm thinking, good heavens, you know, I mean, just what are you thinking? Uh, and and, and um, people are saying, what's going on? You got this disaster and this guy is going, he's on vacation, okay? And uh, <clears throat> so, and I think what it did, it exposed, it also exposed all of the flaws of the Bush administration in terms of their decision-making style that, most of us looking at this knew, but you were never able to see it. Great at ideas, lousy at implementation, okay? If you read Bob Woodward's book, Colin Powell says, you break a rack, you own it. You know, if the president can, I support you. Well, the next question should have been, well, what do I do when I own it? Okay, well, you know, that didn't seem to be, you know, a, a, a concern. Or, okay, what is, you know, who, you know, who's in charge here? You know, uh, the FEMA, you know, what's the relationship with Chertoff, you know, and all this uh, type, you know, type of thing. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. I say you're all lawyers. I, I think having a lawyer with no real world experience is not the person you want to run FEMA. Or, I mean, to run the uh, um, uh, uh, Homeland Security. Chertoff's a lawyer and a judge. Okay, fine. Send him to the Supreme Court. Well, maybe not, but, you know, but the fact of the matter is, don't put them in charge, you know, with no real world experience, okay? I mean, I taught at the Coast Guard Academy, and so I know a lot of the Coast Guard thing. Alan would have been running FEMA, you know, or somebody, you know, in, in charge, somebody who has some operational uh, experience, you know, running that thing, because, you know, you can't afford to be wrong in this job, okay? The other side, if he can make, say, you're wrong once, it, it could be over. And so, um, I mean, people knew that. And then they're asking, okay, uh, you know, why, why weren't you, you thinking about it? And then they didn't, obviously, that's not the criteria. They value loyalty more than competence, okay? If we were in competence, Rumsfeld would be gone and Powell would still be there. But he's gone and Rumsfeld's still there, okay? Other questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what should the states? Uh, uh, what the states should do to to get out of Iran? Uh, you know, properly. But what's happening now is that they did a good job in, in taking over Iran, Iraq. I'm sorry. Iraq. Uh, 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 yeah. And and but I have problems nowadays with the guerrilla. The equipment is not made for for that environment. People is fighting with the, mm -hmm. you know almost homemade weapons, and and. All the power seems to be useless, and, and that's mm -hmm. becoming a, a big problem from a strategy point of view. Mm -hmm. what, what, what would be your advice? All right, if, if I were advising, I'd tell them this. Rack's going to have an election this year. I don't know if they're going to vote for the Constitution, vote for a new government, or go for another government to write the Constitution. As soon as that election is over, I would say, okay, 
By the end of 2006, I'm cutting down the number of troops at least in half. By the end of 2007, for all practical purposes, I'm gone. Now, I'll leave a residual force here if you want it. I'll put it in Kuwait. I'll put it, you know, at sea in case, you know, bin Laden or somebody should come marching down from Turkey or Iran should invade or, you know, something, something like that. Because you've reached a point of diminishing returns. Even forget what you're doing to our own army. But the fact of the matter is we're now part of the problem. And as long as they know you'll be there, there's no incentive for those people to get their act together. Okay? Uh, you know, people talk about, well, we've got to train the Iraqi army. And all. It's not a question of training. If we had a draft, you guys would be there for 12 weeks in basic training, then you'd be off to war. It's motivation. Okay? Who's training the insurgents? They're pretty darn good. Okay, because they're motivated. So it's not a question of, well, we've got to stay the training, we've got to do this. You know. uh, we're so afraid of the Iraqi forces, we won't give them good equipment, because we don't know what they're going to use it. Okay? Maybe we might train them too well, you see what I mean, in, in, in terms, of, in terms of, uh, of things. So that's what I would do. I wouldn't call it a withdrawal, I call it a strategic redeployment. All right. We need our forces other places. We need the, the National Guard's got to come home. We get problems here at home. We should put some more forces into Afghanistan. We've got to cut down the strain on, you know, on, 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 our, on, you know, on our, our troops. I mean, that's what I would do. Now, can I guarantee that that will give you 100%? No, but I can't guarantee if I stay there forever that I'm going to come out right. You see? So, I mean, basically, that. now let me give you an example of Vietnam. From a military point of view, in Vietnam, if we had done what I'm saying, leave a strategic you know, force in the region, when the North Vietnamese Army came down in 75 and opened the open to, to fight the South Vietnamese Army, from a military point of view, if we could have used our air power and naval power, we could have slowed down that advance. I don't think we'd ever won, but we could have slowed down that advance. But we didn't, couldn't do that because Congress was so fed up with the war in Vietnam that they passed an amendment after 73. No more money can be used for American in combat operations in Vietnam, so there was nothing we could do. But if you have a residual force there and somebody tries to overrun the, uh, overrun the country. But our military, being, they're used to protect Shias from other Shias. Okay? And not just fighting, quote unquote, you know, the, uh, the, the insurgents. And the other thing I would do is get all the countries in the area together and say, look, okay, all of you have an interest in a Iran, Iraq that's not a threat to you, okay? None of you want that. So therefore, you've got to stop sending these foreign fighters and, and things in and, you know, work with us on reconstruction. Because everybody, you know, whether they're Sunnis or Shias, whether it's Iran or Saudi Arabia, nobody wants an Iraq that's a hotbed for terrorists. I mean, that's what I would, you know, that's what I would do. But, you know, what's happened is you got false choices. Stay the course. Well, you know, what course are you on? I'm not sure, okay? And as I, you know, it was quoted in yesterday's New York Times, the late Jim Chase, who I had the pleasure of knowing in my, in my last job at the Council on Foreign Relations. He said, when you use, he's the biographer of Dean Acheson, among other things. He said, when you say, stay the course, that's like somebody who's out in a sailboat gets, you know, the wind blows them, and they know which way they're going, but they just keep going. Okay, don't know where they're going, but, you know. And, <clears throat> or cut and run. No, you're not cutting and run if, you know, basically you're announcing, you know, this withdrawal to uh, ba give them a reasonable opportunity to do it. Because you can't win it militarily. Even your military people will tell you that. You can't win it militarily, so it's time to, to move on. They have an election. They have a government. It's going to be up to them in the final analysis to make the, make the choice. Other questions or comments? Or? Well, listen, thank you all very much for your attention, and uh, good luck. And if you're interested in my answers, you can download that uh, AmericanProgress.org.